some of you may know who we are, but in, those of you who don't, uh, I'm uh, Rod Scully, this is with Windphones. We're from the Wales Government Centre um, at Cardiff University, just over the road. And today's the first of what I believe intended to be uh, several of these uh, master classes. Um, I'm just talking at the beginning because most of today is what is technically known as Richard Windvone studies. Um, so he's going to be um, leading on most of it. I'll jump in here and there. But also, we want you to get involved and at any point it seems pertinent, raise questions, or even if you're just unclear about anything, please feel free to stop us or even beg us to shut up for a second and, um, and interject with comments, thoughts, questions, or, or anything like that. Um, but uh, I'll now hand over to, to Richard, who will be leading for most of this session. Okay, uh, Bonada, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's uh, slightly your kind of guinea pigs uh, today. Um, and with this, we'll see how this goes. There's something slightly strange about coming here to talk to you about an organisation and a structure in which you work. And of course, you are experts in particular aspects of this in ways that we can ever hope to be. You will understand nuances and you will get, uh, you'll have insights that we simply can't share as outsiders. But what hopefully we can bring to proceedings, and certainly this is the, this is the hope and the pinning today's session, is we can bring some context, we can bring maybe some concepts and different ways of understanding the things that you may be take for granted and hopefully by the end of, of today some things that you you know you don't quite understand about your daily lives things which may annoy you maybe about your daily lives may make some more sense I'm not saying it's going to help you much but at least you'll have a, a sense of why it is we have this this rather um, in many ways strange model of the evolution what I want to concentrate on today is the form that devolution has taken in Wales. Most of the debates about devolution, certainly in the academic literature, is about patterns of support or public attitudes or whatever, how we ended up politically where we are today. But I'm going to take devolution as a fact. Okay? We'll come back, perhaps in our next session, to public attitudes. We obsess with that as well in our work. But what I want to look specifically at is why have we had this form of devolution in Wales? A form of devolution which is pretty unusual, comparatively speaking, and has got all kinds of weird pathologies, uh, which I'm sure you're only too well aware of. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the form of devolution rather than the fact of devolution. Why this particular model? And then in terms of concepts, I'm just going to kind of throw a few things out there to start with. Most of, and I don't know what your educational backgrounds are, they'll be very different and diverse, I'm sure. But a lot of the um, academic literature and a lot of the kind of underpinning of journalistic treatment of the UK considers the UK to be a unitary state, okay? a centralised unitary state. There is an, another, stand, an, another set of understandings of the UK. Uh, as a state of unions. Okay? So what we don't have is a unitary state, what we have is a series of relationships between different territories and the centre. So it's not a unitary state, although a lot of the textbooks tell you it is, it's a state of unions. And in order to understand that, you need to understand the particular form of relationship between the territories and the central state, which differ. Okay? That's one kind of thing to bear in mind about the UK as a state. Secondly, I want to kind of suggest something about constitution making. How we kind of organise or how do we arrive at the rules by which government works, how institutions kind of live together and operate together. <laughs> now there's a kind of um, idealised model of this. And it's actually usually based on what happened in America. It's usually based on some idea of usually men coming together in a room and thinking great thoughts and coming up with a system of governments. 
So, you know, the, 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 the major kind of example of this is what happened in Philadelphia when the founding fathers, lots of them obviously with Welsh origins, got together <laughs> and threw up, uh, you know, the system that becomes the United States Constitution. Now, that's one idea, and you have, what you have there is a constitutional moment where people sit down and systematically think about the rules of the game. Okay? That's an idealized version. What I think I want to suggest to you in the Welsh context is there are two other concepts which are more helpful. One of which is path dependency. So, you know, a, a furrow is open. You can tell I'm from an agricultural background here, okay? So a furrow is opened up and people continue to operate within the confines of that furrow unless there's something that drags them out to it. Okay? So path dependency. We do things because we've always done them. Okay? And as we'll see in a moment, there's a huge amount of that in terms of Welsh devolution. Okay, what happened in the building that you've got just over there in the early 20th century still has an impact in the early 21st century on the form of devolution. And the second concept is one-partyism. Okay? What is really very interesting about Welsh politics, electorally speaking, and something that Roger and I spend a lot of time thinking about, is one-party dominance. It's very unusual in a political system to have one-party dominance. There are examples at the state level, Japan, the Liberal Democrat Party, you can think about it at the sub-state level, Bavaria, Northern Ireland for a long period under the UUP. We have in Wales, and this is not a normative, this is purely descriptive, okay? I'm not making a comment about whether this is good or bad. We have a <coughs> one-party dominant system. And one of the interesting aspects of Welsh devolution is that most of the key debates about the form of devolution, shall we say, yeah, in terms of the form of devolution, the key debates all happen, with some recent exceptions, within one party. Okay, so if you want to understand devolution, you need to understand the internal politics of the dominant party. And interestingly, one of, one of the characteristics of one party dominant <coughs> systems is that the main cleavages, the main differences, are within the dominant party, not between parties. So we're used to thinking at the British level of you know, the contestation, the major dividing line between Labour and the Conservatives. In one party dominant systems, the major cleavage is within the dominant party. And interestingly, the other parties, which are part of the system, organise themselves around the division within the major party. So, for example, jumping forward, devolution 97, referendum in 97, the Conservatives were desperately trying to support people within the Labour Party who wanted a campaign for a no vote. On the one hand, the Lib Dems and Plaid Cymru were desperately trying to support people within the Labour Party who were campaigning for a yes vote. That's how things work in a dominant party system. So, just a couple of things just to bear in mind, and then just the other kind of conceptual thing just to, just to draw into your attention is there are different forms of devolution. Well, you know, hopefully what I mean by these terms, and I will kind of formally define some of these in a moment. But you've got administrative devolution, the kind of lowest form, if you like, where you have um, uh, a particular central government policy being administered on a certain territorial basis. Then you've got executive devolution, which involves devolving some executive powers to a certain territory, and then of course legislative devolution. And what we've seen in Wales is a move through these phases of devolution to the point where we are now clearly in a system of legislative devolution. Final thing in terms of pre preliminaries, which is a difficult word to say if you've got an Anglesey accent, two quotes. One of which is from a really good book by James Mitchell, uh, which is kind of probably the best single volume kind of study of devolution across the UK. Devolution in the UK is in fact the title. This is a this is a, gr a great quote. A cabinet office official remarked to a colleague in March 1950 
This is from one of the kind of papers in, in, in Q. But though the Scots felt strongly about their national rights, this did not mean that they would relish the kind of flattering, flamboyant, but untruthful documents which might appeal to the Welsh. So the, the, the kind of sense here is the Scots are serious about this kind of stuff. Well, we're just after the symbolic. We're just after the, 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 you know, the bit of fluff. It's that's a brilliant quote, actually, isn't it? <laughs> and then this is a quote from George Thomas, who was of course Secretary of State for Wales in 1973, where he said, "Our that's great." Secretary in 1973. No, he wasn't secretary then. You're right. But this is a quote he made, but he was shadow secretary in 1973. He had been. See, he keeps me honest, doesn't he? Can you imagine our lives together? <laughs> anyway, in, uh, in in when he was shadow secretary in 1973. Uh, and he was, you know, concerned that evolution was on its way. Our greatest mistake was to have set up the Welsh office. So, this is a kind of view where, you know, this stuff doesn't really matter. It's kind of fluff, it's kind of symbolic, it doesn't have any substance. What George Thomas is implying here, however, however is actually you create a dynamic. Okay? By creating the Welsh office, by establishing a system of administrative devolution, by getting groups of people like you with vested interests in more devolution, okay, you create a dynamic which is unstoppable. So the Welsh weren't that silly after all on, on, on that basis. Okay, so just a couple of uh, hopefully uh, things to, to provoke. Okay, now the UK. Um, as Roger knows, I can uh, bore on, on history for, um, for a very, very long time. What we're all aware of, of course, is that the UK is a multinational state. We're also all aware that there are different relationships between Scotland, for example, uh, and the rest of the UK as compared to Wales. So when you go to Scotland, it's very obviously a different country. You know, even the money in your pocket looks different. They have a different legal system operating on the basis of different legal principles. Scotland is very obviously different from Wales. Now, uh, one of the kind of iconic political scientists, uh, Stein Rockham, who spent all his summer holidays in St. David's, for reasons which are obscure and I won't bore you with now, he basically talked about different state forms, okay? And he said, well, you've got your unitary state, but you've also got these other things, which he called union states, where he says the union state does not enjoy direct political control everywhere. Incorporation of parts of its territory has been achieved through treaty and agreement. Consequently, integration is less than perfect. While administrative standardization prevails over most of the territory, the union structure entails the survival in some areas of variations based on pre-union rights and infrastructures. Now, uh, sorry if the writing is, is small at the back there. Now, you can see immediately that this is perfect for Scotland. So lots of Scottish political scientists and legal specialists, they all think, yeah, this is perfect for Scotland because as part of the Treaty of Union, they preserve the church-state relationship in Scotland, they preserve the education system in Scotland, they preserve the legal system in Scotland. So you had all of these pre-union survivals into the UK. And of course the question on the 18th of September this year in Scotland is, you know, how much uh, of this do they want to remain within the UK? So this works for Scotland. However, it obviously doesn't work for Wales because, as you're all aware, nothing really survived what we now call the Acts of Union of 1536 and 1542. In, in fact, the Acts of Annexation. Okay? There were no kind of pre-Union survivals in terms of Welsh legal tradition or institutions. Okay? And even the kind of transitional arrangements disappear. However, interestingly, the Union States which we joined uh, created a kind of space in which Welsh difference could be expressed when you get 
in the 19th century into the age of democratization. And what you see, and this, is, this brings us very directly to administrative devolution, what you see is that when you get democratization, you get the development of liberal political hegemony, liberal party being extremely powerful, and that's underpinned by various social cleavages, all of which overlay each other. So you've got class, you've got religion, obviously, nonconformism versus Anglicanism, you've got language. And you've got these things which overlay each other, and you get a very, very powerful liberal hegemony as a result of that. And one of the things that the liberals try to do is actually get institutional recognition of Wales. And the thing they're really concerned about is religious differences. Okay? And in particular, education. One of the kind of main drivers for the emergence of administrative devolution is a sense amongst Welsh nonconformists, by far the majority of the population, that the Anglicans shouldn't be brainwashing their kids, basically. That's, that's, it's as crude as that, okay? So you get a lot of the early pressure for uh, institutional recognition of Welsh difference is around, uh, religion, is around religious education and education more generally. And also, of course, you get the big, big battle for disestablishment. Uh, the Anglican Church was the state church in Wales after the Act of Union, so-called. Okay, so Scotland had its own church-state relationship as did Ireland, but basically Wales was part of England for religious purposes. The vast majority of the Welsh population were non-conformists. They uh, objected say violently, not with, with fists, but you know what I mean. They were really unhappy about this. So you get this very, very big battle which goes on and on and on for disestablishment of the church in Wales, which finally, <coughs> in 1914, leads to the Welsh Church Act, which then gets enacted after the First World War, which sees uh, the Church of England disestablished in Wales and the establishment of the church in Wales. Now, most historians kind of their eyes glaze over at this establishment. It's, you know, if you talk to students about it, oh my God, you know, they, this is dull, 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 because we live in a very secular country. <coughs> People actually now think that this is irrelevant. But, constitutionally, I think this is really important, because this is where you get Wales recognized by the UK state as, if you feel like, a constituent part of the Union. It's not just a part of England. It's so distinctive that it deserves its own church-state relationship. We don't actually have an official church in Wales, as you know. So this is a really, in, you know, in a secular time, it's actually, I think, quite difficult to understand how important this is. But I would say this is the moment where Wales is kind of recognised as a constituent part of the state rather than basically a part of England. So, uh, you know, this establishment is more interesting than you think. Anyway, so like I say, you get this pressure for the institutional recognition of Welsh difference, which is in effect administrative devolution. And one of the things I always do with my undergraduate students many of whom are you know, from outside of Wales and many are kind of uh, from all over the world really, is basically get them to have a look around Cotes Park. Okay? Because what you can see in front of this building is the uh, architectural expression of the big, big process of administrative devolution that happens and feel like national institutional institution building that happens in Wales in the late 19th century. Am I managing to make, make something move by bouncing here? Uh, you, you, get, you, you can see the kind of physical expression of the process of institution building and administrative evolution that you see in pre-World War I Wales. So you've got your national museum because countries are supposed to have a museum. You've got 
you know, the old federal university building uh, over there. You've got the courts, and indeed, Hill Rawlings, who of course you all know in, in this building, when he had an office over in, I think you call it CP2, he had uh, the architectural plans for Cateas Park. CP1, sorry, thank you. Sorry, see, I, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not an insider, one or two. Uh, um, on the wall, he had the basic, the, the basic plan for Cateas Park from the pre-World War I era, and where these buildings stands, it's the Welsh Parliament. This is where they envisaged building the Welsh Parliament when they were doing the kind of uh, physical building and planning of Cateas Park. So you see a, a very distinct kind of pre-World War I phase, then there's an obvious post-World War II phase, and then there's this kind of interregnum, interwar interregnum, where some kind of interesting things happen, but that big process is halted by, you know, essentially by the Great Depression, which has this catastrophic uh, effect uh, in Wales. What was driving administrative devolution in this period? And I think there's a kind of, uh, there's, a, there's a theme here throughout. Is you've got functional opportunities. So, for example, you're establishing a national insurance system. How are you going to administer that? Well, you've got, you know, you've got small land Welsh nationalists saying, we'll do it on a Welsh basis. You've got other people saying, no, 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 North Wales fits more neatly with Merseyside. Or South Wales should go in with Bristol or whatever. So you've got a battle over how you administer whatever policy it is. So there's a functional opportunity, and then there's a kind of fight over how you then administer this. And eventually, over time, that fight is won largely on a Welsh basis. Okay, and this is it's the functional opportunity. We're going to um, we're going to nationalise electricity. Well, actually, the nationalists lost that one. So when I was growing up, Man Webb was North Wales and Merseyside and, you know, so they didn't win all of them, but they won enough to create this kind of sense that Wales was a natural unit when that had been uh, resisted uh, a lot, actually. So anyway, um, you get the kind of post for, uh, the, the pre-World War I period of institutional building, the origins of administrative devolution, the establishment of kind of Welsh branch offices for various things, some particular Welsh policies as well in education, some stuff in health, a lot of that around TB, which was such an epidemic here in Wales, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, after World War II, you see a kind of steady advance a steady building up of um, a Welsh administrative dimension to uh, the civil service and UK politics. Now, there are lots of interesting things underpinning this, and if we had kind of time, we could kind of go into um, we could go into all you know we could go into all of this. Interestingly, one of the things I'm just going to pick out is Scotland. One of the interesting constants in the Welsh devolution debate is looking to Scotland. Okay? There is a continual process of comparing ourselves to them and saying we want what they've got. So, for example, the debates around the establishment of the Welsh office you know, are suffused with references to the apparent advantages that Scotland had from having a Scottish office. In particular, in the Second World War, the guy called Tom Johnson, who was Secretary of State for Scotland, and was basically seen as the King of Scotland. He ran the place, and was very effective, so people perceived, in making the war effort work in terms of rebuilding the Scottish economy. And so during the war years, there are lots of people in the Labour Party going, actually, a Welsh office on those lines would be hugely advantageous and you know that kind of rhetoric is still heard today is today when we talk about um, reserve powers model you know there's, there's there's a constant comparing up to Scotland 
Okay, running through this uh, very quickly. There are kind of few um, important kind of milestones in the development of administrative evolution post Second World War. You got the establishment of the Council of Wales and Monmouthshire in 1949. This is the period, of course, where there were still doubts as to whether Monmouthshire was properly in Wales, which kind of that kind of debate uh, kind of I think is finally settled in, in, the, in the 50s. But at this stage, Wales and Monmouthshire. You get the Minister of Welsh Affairs, and by 1951, you've got various departments and agencies with Welsh officers or units. A lot of them congregated there, CP1. <laughs> got it right now. And then, of course, you get in 1964, the first Secretary of State for Wales is appointed, and the Welsh office is established. Uh, and there's a really interesting story around that. They get Jim Griffiths, of course, as the first Secretary of State. They've been Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, highly, highly respected figure in the Labour Party, uh, who had been an advocate of Home Rule, then opposed it, then became an advocate, certainly of administrative devolution, again. <coughs> and what the, I mean, again, I can bore, bore for Wales on this, I'll try not to, the, the, the papers from Whitehall are absolutely fascinating about this, because there's a huge rearguard action in Whitehall against the establishment of the Welsh Office. It's a Labour commitment in its manifesto, uh, Wilson appoints Griffiths, and basically all the permanent secretaries say, no, 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 this would be terrible, the end, it's the end of the world, you can't do this. Such is the level of resistance that, um, that Jim Griffiths, ultra, ultra loyal party man that he was, threatens to resign. It went so far that Jim Griffiths felt he had to resign, which would have been you know, a real blow for a Wilson government which was very weak uh, in that period. And so eventually, you know, um, uh, arms are twisted and Whitehall is made to behave. But there was huge resistance at that key moment to the establishment. Largely, and this is interesting, largely because the view of the permanent secretaries who were most opposed was once you open the door, they're gonna keep, they're gonna keep wanting more and more and more. It was the kind of uh, uh, it was the kind of scenario that you get from George Thomas. You know, once you've set this thing up, you're not going to be able to control it. You're not going to be able to stop them. And they were right. They were right. <laughs> yeah, they were right. And of course, interestingly, what happens is that you get powers being transferred. You know, once it's gone, once it's established, late sixties is a further tranche. 70s and even in the 1980s and this, this is you know genuinely I think interesting and remarkable even in the 1980s after Wales has rejected devolution by a margin of four to one four to one in the referendum even when you have in Downing Street in Margaret Thatcher a figure who is deeply opposed to devolution you get more responsibilities being transferred to the Welsh office. You know, they said George Thomas was right. Once you create the structure, it becomes, we have a nice saying in Welsh, you pan to hear the door. You know, things kind of follow. You, you, you follow in the furrow that has been opened up, path dependency. So what you have by 1997 is extensive administrative devolution. You've also got executive power invested in the Secretary of State. Um, how much was that power used to do things differently is an interesting question. Maybe some of you will know, uh, uh, well, some of you will know more about this than, than I certainly do, but certainly talking to the old timers, the people who were around this place in the late Seven, in, in, you know, in, in the 70s uh, and, uh, and 80s, what old timers got? 
Here I am, I'm all 50 myself. <laughs> what am I doing? Anyway, um, what they will say is that there was very little uh, innovation. There were, very, there, there were some policy areas where on occasion, for whatever reason, things would be done differently. Uh, but on the whole, there was a kind of branch office mentality. You know, there was a, a wariness of doing things differently, unless there were specific um, reasons. On the whole, and th this is a, maybe a very cynical view, but some of the old timers tell me basically we got the policy from London, we slapped the dragon on the cover, and that was our policy. Now, you know, does that ring true? Or is that uh, oh, nodding? Does that still ring true? Anyway, okay. But the point about all of this, the point about all of this, is that it created a political opportunity. What you had there was, in kind of nascent form, the basis for a devolved government, should there be enough popular support to make that happen. Okay? So what happened throughout, through this process, which was a kind of higgledy-piggledy process, and we'll come back to the higgledy-piggledyness of this in a moment, what you get is the gradual building up of a capacity here, but also a gradual building up of a mentality which said, yeah, you can organise things on a Welsh basis. That may sound a trite thing to say now. Well, of course you can organise things on a Welsh basis. That wasn't a common sense assumption in uh, the 1940s, in the 1950s, indeed. Uh, you know, it's something that has evolved and emerged over time. It's now kind of common sense in a way that it just wasn't in the past. So, that hopefully that will make some kind of sense in terms of the, the evolving nature of administrative devolution and the process by which you end up with a, effectively a Welsh layer of UK government. Okay? What I want to now turn my attention to then is executive devolution, by which I mean the form that devolution took when the National Assembly for Wales was established in 1999. Okay? The particular way that devolution was structured in the Welsh context. I'm going to start with uh, a quote from a, um, an Australian academic. We were speaking in 1977. And this was the moment where Labour was trying to legislate for devolution for the first time. Okay? This was a period where uh, devolution was incredibly contentious within the Labour Party and a period where Labour didn't have a working majority in Westminster. So a really bad combination, frankly, if you're trying to do major constitutional reform. Okay? You haven't got a majority, and most of your own party doesn't like it. All so, yeah, uh, ill-fated might be, the, uh, might be the, um, the description. Anyway, so what happened in that period was uh, they initially started out with a joint bill for Scotland-Wales, the Scotland and Wales bill which eventually fell, uh, and then they came back with two separate bills, uh, Scotland and Wales uh, bills separate. So this guy is speaking just at the moment where they're about to lose the Scotland and Wales bill. So that's a little bit of context. And you're going to have to um, excuse my mutilate, mutilation of, of Latin. You've already had my mutilating the English language, and now I'm going to mutilate uh, Latin. What has the platypus of my homeland? Namely, Roger? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> what if Bos Bosinus and, and Latinus? Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. What has the platypus of my homeland, namely, that in common with the nearly extinct Scotland and Wales bill? The answer I would like to suggest is that each is quite unique, the like of which has not been seen before and may not be seen. Okay. Now, the point about this quote is the platypus is a really weird animal. Okay? It's, a, you know, it's a technical phrase that we use. It's a weird animal. So it's got a duck bill, it's got a beaver tail, 
it's, it's, it's got a poisonous kind of node which sticks things and poisons them. You know, it's a, a, apparently um, when, uh, when the first specimen was brought back to London from Australia, they thought it was a kind of hoax, okay? Whenever they took it, the Royal Society, they thought nothing like this could possibly exist. This is so weird, okay? Now, the Welsh evolution model is also following in this kind of weird, okay? So if you think about the way that um, evolution was established, what you had was a body with its own democratic mandate working within the context of laws framed by a body with a different democratic mandate. It could spend quite a lot of money but not raise any. There was no real distinction between the government and the legislature. So all the kind of basic tenets of kind of constitutional theory, separation of powers, all of that stuff was ignored. So this was a pretty weird looking body, okay? Unique, the, the platypus. Um, that's the kind of quote. The interesting thing about this is, of course, in Wales, we have, in many ways, the platypus has left us. We have something which looks much more orthodox. However, what we've done in terms of the powers of the assembly exact, is actually adopt the model suggested for Scotland in the late 70s, rather than the one enacted in Scotland in the late 1990s. We'll come back to that in a moment. So some of this platypus thing still lives on, arguably in the regular appearances in the Supreme Court of uh, Welsh. Anyway, so the platypus. How did we end up with the platypus? Shameless advertising. <laughs> if you're interested in, in this stuff in more detail, there's a great book, Roger wrote the best bits, uh, uh, which, which kind of tells the story in, 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 in more depth. So, executive devolution. What does this mean? I'm going to give you a, a few minutes break at, at some stage fairly soon. Roger, you can probably uh, decide where that happens. Because yeah. you know me, I'll just talk for two hours and that's not a good idea. Um, uh, Kilbrandon Commission, of course, was established um, in 1969. This was the moment where Labour was really divided on devolution. There were people within the Labour Party who wanted to build on the Welsh office and actually establish some form of assembly. There were others who were dead, dead, dead set against it, not only in Wales, but crucially in Scotland. The Scottish Labour Party was virulently opposed to devolution. But, like Cymru had just won a by-election victory in in Carmarthen in 1966. The SNP had won in Hamilton in 1967. There was, you know, this was the age where uh, Labour MPs had usually done, you know, manual working jobs rather than all being lawyers and lecturers. And actually, you know, you'd have regular deaths and by-elections. So there was another by-election in the Ponda in 67, another by-election in Caerphilly in 1968. In all of which Plaid Cymru did remarkably well. Okay, Labour thought they'd lost Cat Philly in '68. Plaid you know, it was it was an amazing swing. Just held on. Labour felt they had to do something about evolution, and so they established a royal commission. When in doubt, establish a royal commission. Uh, it'll take several years to report. Um, and in, in the case of Kilbrandon, of course, let me get this right now. There was a minority report, but also uh, within the majority report, there were several different uh, minorities suggesting different things. So there were minorities within the majority support. Okay, so so you know this was a, this was a, a, a imperfect in many ways, but handily they described executive evolution. 
Uh, they said the, uh, the essence of this is that Parliament and central government would be responsible for the framework of legislation and major policy on all matters, but would, whenever possible, transfer to directly elected regional assemblies the responsibility within that framework for devising policies for the regions, for the execution of those policies, and for general administration. Now, this is quite expansive. This is saying central government, we're going to create the broad framework and we're going to push the responsibility within that you to you. There's also an added pathology here in the Welsh context. The whole debate about devolution in the 60s, late 60s, becomes linked to our old friend local government reform. Nothing is new. Nothing is new in Welsh politics. It all comes back to bite you. Local government reform was, an, again, if you look back into the 50s and the 60s, bang on about this all the time. And uh, what devolutionists did was, and again, we're going back to using functional opportunities to push a different agenda, what they said is, we'll link devolution to local government reform. We'll have local government reform and we'll have a Welsh level as the top player of reformed local government. So in the Welsh context, and this may explain those of you working in, uh, for the assembly in the first years of devolution, why it was also very weird, okay? Because in Wales, Executive devolution became associated with local government style internal structures, the body corporates and all that kind of stuff. Okay? This is a direct legacy of the way that devolution was linked to uh, local government reform back in the late 60s. This was the opportunity structure. And so path dependency, these things get part of the debate, part of the plan and continue as such. No formal uh, separation between the executive and the legislature, rather you get a single body corporate. All members responsible for all devolutions rather than the executive, the government. Sorry? All members responsible for all decisions, not devolutions. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> all members responsible for all devolutions. So, you know, it's not the executive making the decision, the legislature hold them to account. Everybody is kind of responsible for the decision. You get a committee structure where, for example, the education committee will make the decision. This was the kind of local government model. Interestingly, of course, local government moved away from this in the late 90s, just as we thought this was a great time to institute it for Welsh devolution. There we are. So, so, uh, at the same time as local government was moving to the leader and cabinet system, we decided this was the way forward. So, how did we end up with the model of executive devolution that we ended up with in Wales? And some of you had to try and make work in the first years of devolution. Uh, cutting a long and slightly convoluted story first, you need to go back to 1969. You can trace back what happened, what was established in Wales in 1999 to a debate within the Labour Party in 1969. Okay? So it takes 30 years for this thing to work its way through. As I said, what Labour did in response to its own internal difficulties about devolution and the rise of the nationalists was establish a royal commission. So, you know, kick it into the long grass. Kind of cynical view, but I think it's probably fair to be quite cynical about this, okay? There was one flaw in this plan. There was one flaw in the kick it into the long grass plan, which was, what evidence does Labour give to this commission? Okay, we've established it. It's going to look at how the UK should be governed. Do we as a party have a view on this? Or can we pretend that we don't? Can we just say, you go away and do this, all the other parties can put in their evidence, but somehow we, we don't have a view. Well, you know, it was decided that not having a view as a party was untenable. So, Labour had to establish its own policy on this. And what happened then uh, is that Emrys Jones, really interesting guy, who was secretary of the Labour Party in Wales, <coughs> 
is Gottsy who is a very keen evolutionist. That needs to be um, needs to be underlined. He basically got together a group of young Turks, people who are you know keen, all keen evolutionists, or kind of people around Cardiff actually, um, to come up with a plan. And this would be Welsh Labour's policy. The problem was they came up with this really far-reaching plan, okay? basically for a federal structure. So Wales was going to have a powerful parliament with really extensive powers, and they'd be looking at Australia and Canada, and, you know, and they were all a bit geeky, and they came up with this fantastic plan for very far-reaching devolution. Suddenly, George Thomas hears all about this. And he was the Secretary of State for Wales. Clegan Hills had gone by then, and, and uh, who you know, would have been fine with this far-reaching plan. George Thomas is horrified, absolutely horrified. He even interrupts Harold Wilson's holiday. Um, who was, uh, he used to go on holiday to the Isles of Scilly. I don't know if you know this. He used to go there every year to the Isles of Scilly. And he gets a letter on his summer holiday. I am very concerned, says George Thomas, about what's going on in Transport House in Cardiff. Because they've come up with this kind of crazy plan for lots of devolution. So what then happens is that George Thomas comes in with his own plan, which is basically, I've got to give them something, but it's the minimum. Basically, what I want to do is protect the position of Welsh MPs. Nothing that will impact upon the prerogatives of Welsh MPs. Okay, so what you end up with is a system of executive devolution, whereby the basic framework will be set out in Westminster legislation, but within that we will establish an elected body, you have to concede that, big concession, it will have its own mandate, we will have a body which can operate within that system. Basically a form of executive devolution. So, George Thomas basically crushes Emerus Jones and the Young Turks, you know, puts them on the naughty step, comes up with his own plan for an elected Welsh council, it's called then, with some executive powers, um, and that is presented in 1970 as Labour's official policy for Wales. Okay? And it actually is in Labour's 1970 election manifesto. So this is the moment where Labour, on a UK level or a British level, actually commits itself to Welsh devolution and that particular form of executive devolution. And from then on, that commitment remains consistent right through until the establishment of the Assembly in 1999. Okay? That's the moment where executive devolution becomes official labour policy for Wales. So, in 1973, Kilbrandon reports, taken four years, done a good job guys, the chair has died in the interim, they bought in a new chair, a couple of members have died, they've all disagreed with each other, but, okay, what happens is that Kilbrandon reports, um, the majority of the majority, <laughs> the majority of the majority have recommended legislative devolution for Wales. Okay. What will Labour do, brilliantly, is say they welcome uh, the publication of the report and say it's great that you've agreed with us. Which was not true, but you know, this is, this is good. Politicians are really good at this. Okay, So basically, congratulations, Kilbrandon Commission, for agreeing with us, although they haven't. Okay, What they say is, this is support for our own proposals. So. February 1974, Labour go into that general election arguing for executive devolution for Wales, but no devolution at all for Scotland. Okay, brilliant, this is fantastic. Okay? So Labour go into the 1974 general election saying what we want is executive devolution for Wales, which we've been supporting since we chopped off Emmys Jones' legs in 1969. But in Scotland, we don't want anything at all. That's going to work. Of course, what happens in that election is the SNP comes steaming through. 
Okay, so the SMP have a brilliant election, like Cymru do reasonably well. Wilson doesn't have a majority, so there's going to be a quick general election. So by October, when the next general election is held, there's been this remarkable vault fast in Scotland. They now support legislative devolution, i.e. more than Wales. So they've gone from saying you get nothing while Wales gets executive devolution to saying, no, no, you get more than Wales by October uh, in, um, to try and head off the SNP. Okay? So you emerge from the, 19th, the second general election of 1974 with Labour committed to devolution to both Scotland and Wales in different forms. Okay? But also, crucially, Labour, you know, this, this is not going to be a stable government. The SNP, and to some extent, Plaid Cymru are on the rise. That says you need to do something about this. You've also got the Liberals resurgent, Jeremy Thorpe and all that. Not all that, you know what I mean. I wasn't, I wasn't going there, Roger. Those of you who know Jeremy Thorpe will know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, what you have is the Liberals are back in business. They, of course, committed historical commitments of home rule. So there are lots of reasons why Labour can't simply let this devolution thing lie. So what they do is eventually legislate after a slightly expiring period. But what they legislate is essentially executive devolution. It's the model they've committed to in 1969, the model they've suggested to Bill Brand in 1970. There are some minor changes. Uh, in the sense that John Morris, who was Secretary of State for Wales, was a devolutionist, is a devolutionist, was a believer, and so his version of executive powers was expansive. I mean, if George Thomas's view is that the Secretary of State keeps most of his powers, and the executive powers that go to the, the Assembly would be from the Quangos, what we now call the Quangos, okay? Um, John Morris said, no, you can have some of my power as well. Okay, so he was more expansive, more generous, but it's still the basic model. That's then legislated in the 1978 Wales Act with the enactment subject to the results of the 1979 referendum, which is lost you know, by, by a country mile. Fast forward, late 80s. There's a whole kind of, um, after 1979, there's a whole kind of body of uh, writing, especially in Welsh language literature, which gets really pessimistic at this point, where, you know, it's the end of Wales. Wales has voted itself out of history and all this kind of very uh, emotional uh, stuff. Some of the poetry is fantastic, you know. Mae'r Gwenwyn yn y coed. The... Um, Poison is in the trees, and Gwyneth Williams wrote of we are a naked people living under an acid ray. <laughs> so there's this whole kind of uh, there's this whole kind of period of that you know that's it, that's it, boys. And I was I was brought up in a family of devolutionists, and my poor father broke his heart. And I think if we hadn't have been a, a kind of the wrong age, they would have emigrated. Frankly, they've had enough. Um, but devolution re-emerges onto the agenda relatively quickly, given the size of the defeat, okay? Um, it re-emerges, and there are all kinds of weird and wonderful things going on here. One of the things which originally gets it going back onto the Labour agenda is John Prescott wanting to do English regions. Bizarrely enough, that never happened, obviously. But Prescott in the 80s was really pushing for English regions, and so Labour were in a position of saying, we want devolution for Scotland, English regions, but nothing for Wales. Which wasn't really a, a tenable kind of policy position. So Prescott urges the Welsh party to engage with devolution. Uh, you've also then, of course, after 87 in particular, uh, got the pressure which starts to build in Scotland. After 1987, you get the Scottish... Uh, the, the Declaration, the Scottish Constitutional Convention, all of these kind of moves for Scottish devolution, 
which are backed by the Labour Party, by the Liberal Party, working together. Okay? So by the late 80s, you got to the stage where devolution is back onto the agenda. And then especially post-1992, when Ron Davis becomes Shadow Secretary of State for Wales, and he was, you know, he was somebody who'd opposed devolution in 79, but changed his mind. I've never understood quite when and how. There's, there's one, um, there's a book by um, John Osman, which uh, Welsh Europeans it's called, right? where he claims that Ron Davis' story is that after the 87 election, he was driving down the road and there was a slogan on the bridge which said, we voted Labour and we got the Tories. Yeah? And, and this was then enough to shift him from being anti-devolution. There must be more than seeing a slogan uh, at the side of the road. Uh, but anyway, so he is genuinely committed to this and re-engages with devolution. However, however, this is the key point in terms of the form of devolution. His view is, actually, it's going to be so difficult to get this through the party. Okay? This is a party which had split from top to bottom of devolution in the late 70s. It had been rejected by the Welsh electorate by an overwhelming majority. So, you know, it, it was far from obvious that going back to this was going to be uh, easy or profitable. What he basically decided was there's no point in going back to the form of devolution. Okay? What we're going to do is take our commitments from the late 70s as red. We'll basically use those plans and just argue about the principle of devolution. Because if you start opening up the form of devolution, you know, you're just going to create too many problems for yourself. This is already going to be extremely difficult. So what the Labour Party do is essentially take their plans from the 1970s and, you know, re-engage with those and recommit to those plans. And so what was in the white paper in the referendum, okay, and of course bear in mind this was all about the internal politics of the Labour Party. There was no suggestion there was going to be another referendum. What you needed to do was get it through the party, get, get it into the manifesto. The, the uh, referendum commitment came much later, it was Tony Blair's, it looks as if it was a kind of personal intervention by Blair in 96, which gets us the referendum. So in the early 90s, what Ron's strategy is basically, I'll get this through the party. The party's already agreed to this form of devolution in the past, let's stick with this. Um, so that's what he does, and therefore, when we get to 1997, the only, literally the only substantive difference between the proposals rejected in 1979 and the ones very, very, very narrowly accepted in 97 was the voting system. That was really the only thing that was different. Okay? What we had, of course, was a semi-proportional voting system. That was put in there, I think in part because some of the people involved believed in it but also because they needed to build support in the context of a referendum from the other opposition, then opposition parties, okay? That was the only substantive difference. Everything else was basically what was in the, we the Wales Act 1978. And indeed, which goes right back to here. Yeah, which goes right back to here. So actually, what we got in the white paper in 97 was basically executive evolution as projected through this kind of process. And indeed, one of the senior civil servants in this place at the time tells me that when it became clear that Labour was going to win the 1997 election, he literally, I, the quote is, I went back to my beloved papers from the 1970s and brushed off the dust. Okay. So there is a direct link from 1969 to 1997. Okay, so a um, couple of 
couple kind of broad uh, conceptual points come out to that. Um, you know, first, uh, and in many ways the most fundamental of which is about party dominance. It's about the way that, in terms of working out the form that the evolution takes, only labour really matters. It's the internal processes within labour. The other parties kind of orientate themselves around Labour's proposals. So, you know, people in, like, Cymru find themselves del delivering Labour leaflets, leaflets in the 1979 um, referendum. <laughs> Uh, but also the proposals and suddenly executive evolution as a kind of concept was as much about bridging divisions within the party as it was about delivering an effective system of government. I mean, when you go and look at the papers, when you go and have a, you know, the calculations involved are, you know, what can we, what, what will not divide the party? What do we need to do, which we have to do, but won't divide the party? So you end up with a series, and this is not a criticism, because, you know, this is about political realities. This is the structural landscape. This is a structural reality. Um, so it's about bridging divisions on an issue which is highly, highly contentious. So, 1997. What's put to the people in the white paper is basically, as I say, the 1978 model, internal structures, local governments. Incidentally, this is kind of, people forget this. The cabinet wasn't there in the white paper. The cabinet came during the legislative period. So one of the kind of most fundamental things about evolution post-1999 wasn't even part of the proposal put to the Welsh electorate in the 1997 referendum. What was envisaged there was the, you know, the local government model proper. You know, there would be an education committee, etc. Okay? The powers were those of the old Welsh office. Delegated legislative powers only. Now that is actually worth a moment to pause on going back to the higgledy piggledy nature of Welsh devolution. This, you, you may, depending on how long you've worked in this place, have seen the transfer of functions order. Okay? This is the technical guide. This is, this is what the devolution units prepared in November 1998. And this actually is the document which sets out in most detail what the powers of the new assembly were. It is, including index, 527 pages long. And if you haven't seen this, you can flick through it and you'll find different pieces of Westminster legislation. Uh, we've got the mines and quarries, open brackets, tips, close brackets, <laughs> act. 1969. Uh, we've got the Bees Act, oh that's great, the Bees Act 1980. There's the Tropical Fish Act. My favourite is the, the Docking and Nicking of Horses Act. <laughs> literally, literally. And then the Bees Act, okay, uh, you'll see uh, the Secretary of State for Wales has the powers, according to section one, open brackets, one, close brackets, power to make joint order for the purpose of preventing the introduction or spreading of bee diseases to Great Britain, okay? And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, setting out the powers that the Secretary of State has, which are then being transferred to the National Assembly. None of these powers have ever been kind of set out on the basis that one day, a body with its own democratic mandate, with its own policy priorities, will be trying to actually run a country on the basis of that. So basically, this is, you know, you, you'll, you'll have seen the, the American constitution. My, 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 my kids go to school in Norway and they are taught to venerate the 1814 constitution of Norway. In lots of countries in the world, the constitution is a document that you respect. 
I'm going to submit to you <laughs> that the transfer of functions order isn't really uh, something that you're going to uh, venerate or spend any greater time uh, admiring. Uh, so the powers were s kind of a mishmash, uh, uncoordinated. The internal structure was the local government model. The key difference, semi-proportional, uh, AMS system, which I'm sure we'll discuss in a future uh, in, a, in, a, in a future class of this nature. There's also, of course, a real issue about legitimacy. Tiny referendum majority of 6,721, which is 0.3% of the eligible electorate. Uh, low turnout. This is, you know, it's, it's not a, a great, uh, a great package, to say the least, in terms of the structure, or in terms of the uh, support. Now, what you've seen, however, uh, is since 1999, <laughs> a really rapid process of constitutional change. Now, I keep getting invited these days to Scotland, and I I'm kind of I'm fighting a losing battle. But I keep telling them Wales is much more interesting than Scotland. In terms of, you know, I know, I know, you've got, you've got to try it, you? But in terms of what's happened since 99 till now, now maybe Scotland gets really interesting uh, in a few uh, weeks' time, okay? But until now, the Scottish model of devolution has been remarkably stable. There's been one kind of major piece of legislation, the Scotland Act 2012. But even that is pretty limited, actually. In Wales, there's been this very rapid process of change. It's all been really unstable. Um, there was a great line, the only great line in the 97 referendum campaign, which was kind of eminently forgettable, except for the results. Tim Williams, Dr. Tim Williams, was now uh, in Sydney, of course. Um, Tim Williams was a, one of the leaders of the law campaign. He said, if Wales gets devolution, it'll be like a banana republic without the bananas. Okay? And there is, there is something of the kind of banana republic in, in the, to the extent that it's been so unstable, so much has changed. It's been constant change. But what's happened, really, is that we've shed the skin of this original model. What's happened is that this kind of really kind of platypus-like, unorthodox model of evolution has been shed, and we've adopted what looks more and more like an orthodox Westminster model of doing government in Wales. It's kind of ironic because at the time, uh, in the very early years of evolution, people, I remember having a really heated argument with Lord Ellis Thomas on the platform of Machanthev Station. God knows what both of us were doing on the platform of Machanthev. And he was telling me, it's all going to be so different. We're going to, be, we're going to reject all those things they do in Westminster. And it, it was a point of pride that Welsh devolution would be different from the terribly old-fashioned ways that they do things in Westminster. It's going to be a new politics. But in reality, what we've seen is the adoption of a kind of more and more kind of orthodox Westminster family type system. This has been part of a move away from executive devolution to legislative devolution. And that means, of course, both powers, but also internal structures. As I said earlier, in the Welsh context, executive devolution had come to have all this kind of local government package, which has kind of gradually been got rid of. In terms of development, well, how much has this been a continuation in terms of one party dominance? Well, there was a period in the early years of devolution where arguably there was more kind of cooperation between the parties up until the publication of the Richard Commission report in 2004. I'll come back to that, it's a decade since the Richard Commission report. Incredible. But in the making of the 2006 Act, this is very, very, very much an internal process within the Labour Party. That is an internal Labour Party uh, plan. Interestingly, it may well be that Silk, 
is disrupting that one party dominance again. Certainly, uh, the, the, the new Wales Act, whenever it reaches the uh, statute book, uh, is not necessarily something the Labour Party would have come up with le left to its own devices, certainly at this point in time. The point to make also is that you've still got a lot of path dependency. There's a lot of kind of continuation in all of this. So what do I mean by the Westminster model? This is very quick and quick and dirty and crude, and I apologize to those of you who know all of this stuff. Basically, the idea of separation of powers, the executive is drawn from the legislature and accountable to it, but in a sense separate. So you have a separation of powers, the executive is drawn from the legislature and accountable to it. You have a permanent civil service working with the executive. It's majoritarian, at least in the idealized version. It's self-regulating, again, in the idealized model. It's free from external constraints, again, in the idealized model. I kind of stress idealized model because, obviously, even the Westminster model itself, well, actually, doesn't really regulate it. It's, it's, the courts are much more assertive than they used to be, and there's the European dimension, which suggests that external constraints. But, this is an idealized version, okay? But in a sense, we all know where we are with that. And, you know, my, my argument is that what we've seen in Wales is a cleaving to this kind of idea of evolution. Uh, in terms of how this process comes about, um, you know, the original model of evolution doesn't even last a year, frankly. It doesn't even last a year. You get the, the kind of palace coup, which gets rid of Alan Michael. You get Padre Morgan coming into his inheritance. Uh, you get some really interesting things going on politically in terms of the rebranding of Welsh Labour, which is a really interesting thing, which we might come back to in another session. But constitutionally, we get a move from what Richard Rawlings, brother of Hugh, uh, he says we move from a Welsh Office Plus model of devolution, which you had under Alan Michael. So the view would be that Alan Michael basically behaved at least as if we were still the Welsh Office, but there were a bunch of these elected members making a nuisance of themselves. But basically nothing fundamentally had changed to what um, Richard Rawlings calls a virtual parliament. Okay? Within the context of the body corporate, and the legislation, we're going to do as much as possible to make this look and feel and behave like a parliament. That's the academic conceptualization from the Welsh Office Plus to virtual parliament. Prodry Morgan, in his own inimitable fashion, said, we're stretching the elastic of the 98 uh, Government of Wales Act. You can choose uh, whichever language you want. But what this meant, what the stretching of the elastic, that's a fantastic phrase. Isn't it? What basically de facto changes? Okay, lots of things without changing the legislation. Lots of symbolic and uh, actual changes. So, for example, changes in the job titles. Um, Wales was very definitely not on the same status as Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland. And part of the way, and there were lots of actually, there's some really interesting stuff about the arguments within the UK cabinet about this. And there was some real kind of insistence, you're not as important, and therefore this needs to be reflected in job titles. Okay? So we didn't have a first minister in Wales, Alan Michael was a first secretary. Prodry Morgan just made the decision to change that, knowing for, full well, of course, that uh, in Welsh there's no difference between prime minister and first minister. He was very well aware that he was promoting himself to the same status uh, as Tony Blair. Um, the symbolic stuff is really interesting. So just, just as a kind of aside, one of the things that the Assembly wasn't allowed as part of this whole uh, argument within the Cabinet was a mace. You know, a legislative mace. Legislatures in the Westminster model have a mace. And it wasn't allowed one in the early years of devolution. So when they opened the Senedd, they were given a mace by New South Wales. I don't know if you know this, but the, the mace in the Senedd was given by New South Wales. And there's a brilliant story when they were opening the building. 
um, that the Speaker of New South Wales Parliament turned up at Heathrow and went into the anything to declare <laughs> section of the airport <laughs> with this bloody great mason. To, have you got anything to declare? Yes, this is for the uh, National Assembly for Wales. And apparently there were then frantic phone calls from customs in Heathrow to Cardiff Bay trying to ascertain if this strange man wielding a strange implement was actually uh, telling the truth. Anyway, sorry, I, I, I digress. But anyway, so you get these changes in the job titles. You also get more kind of uh, um, practically important was an increased profile for the presiding office, a presiding officer, and the development of a structure around him. So for example, and this is again one of the kind of interesting um, largely untold stories of the early years. When they had the process which actually brought down Alan Michael, um, the presiding officer, David L. Thomas, was looking for legal advice. But of course, because it, there was this strange kind of body corporate system, the only lawyers were here. Okay? And uh, the, it was very problematic for the presiding officer to, uh, to talk to lawyers here to get advice to bring down uh, the first secretary. So he actually, he actually ended up in Cardiff Law School, just, just uh, there, looking for legal advice on what his powers were in this context. There wasn't a setup around the speaker, around the presiding officer, to provide to what, because there was no separation between the legislature and the executive. So what you get is the building up the role of the presiding officer, get the officers of the PO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you get this gradual building up of a separate legislative infrastructure. 2002, uh, you get WAG. Is WAG still confusing? It's still out there, you know, WAG is still out there. It's, 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 it's taking a long time to die. Um, also crucially, of course, as part of the coalition deal with the Lib Dems in 2000, I mean, Labour do really well out of that coalition deal. Because, frankly, if you look at Labour's manifesto for the 99 Assembly election, it's pretty thin. This was not really a programme for governments. There wasn't much substance. What they got from the Lib Dems was a whole raft of policies. And the, the coalition agreement between the two parties, they call it a partnership agreement, is full of Lib Dem uh, ideas, for better or worse. What Lib Dems got, you know, they got obviously uh, bums on the ministerial um, kind of seats, but also they got a, ref a look at the electoral system for local government, which is probably this dusty shelf somewhere in this building, holding the Sutherland Commission. Uh, review. But I also got the Richard Commission, which looked at the powers and the arrangements of the Assembly. Uh, Richard then doesn't report until after the 2003 Assembly election. So they've been in a one term of the Ball government. And what you get from Richard, from Ivor Richard, is a absolutely cutting assessment of the structure of devolved government that had been established on the basis of the 90 attack. I remember going to the launch when he sat, sat there saying, the system is grotesque. <laughs> well, that, is a, that, is, that is strong language. That's a strong adjective. He said, this is grotesque. Basically, this system is, a, is a, you know, it's just a complete mess. And what you got then was a very, very radical report saying that what we want is formal de jure separation of powers, so constitute, reconstitute a government and an assembly. None of this body corporate nonsense. What we want are legislative powers on the Scottish model, reserve powers model, with an interim move to framework powers. That was to happen by 2011. So, interestingly, that was to happen by 2011. Um, he said, the assembly is too small, 60 members is not enough in terms of, if you're drawing the executive from 60, then the remaining, the remainder just not enough to hold the government with legislative powers, or a government operating in the context of legislative powers, 
Uh, you can't hold them to account with so few members. We want more members. They decide you've got an 80, 80 fairly arbitrary number, to be honest with you. But obviously, if you're going to change the number of assembly members, you have to change the electoral arrangements. They argue for STB. Interestingly, um, given how narrow the referendum majority had been in 97, they were confident in making these recommendations on the basis of the evidence, a lot of it which we'd uh, been involved in, in collecting, which had shown that there'd been a big shift in public attitudes to devolution since 97. Um, even by 2004, well actually even by 1999, in the two years between the referendum and the first election, there'd been a big shift in terms of support for devolution. But they were confident that there was enough public support for devolution to recommend something that radical. Okay? So this would have been this would have been a radical, you know, in terms of constitutional moments, had this been enacted, this would have changed the game. Because this wasn't going to be path dependent in the way anything had been before. This was radical, this was very different indeed. What happened? Um, there was universal welcome for separation. Interestingly, even those people who had been opposed to devolution originally, even people who probably remained opposed to devolution saw the sense that if you're going to have it, then there is a logic in having a separation. So that was kind of universally welcome. Otherwise, what you've got was a reversion to kind of party dominant mode of politics. Uh, we went back, now obviously Labour was in power, so, um, uh, and this was a divisive issue within the party, so none of this is to make a normative point, it's structural, you know, it's entirely understandable if you're one of the people involved in this. What you get is Labour rejecting changes to the electoral system. Um, Peter Hayden, to be fair, did make a point in a conference that maybe there was an argument for 80, but then ran away from that. But attacking dual candidacy, this idea that people be, could be candidates uh, in constituencies and on the list. You then got an assertion that a referendum was necessary to move to primary powers. Okay? So you can't have primary powers without another referendum. That was a key key moment. And then you see Rodri Morgan in particular looking for alternative ways of empowering an assembly short of what he considered to be primary powers. So it's kind of slightly convoluted process around that. Also on the referendum you get what appeared at the time to be a really key concession. Labour MPs managed to get uh, agreement that any referendum would be post-legislative, not pre-legislative. Okay? Why is that significant? In 1979, we got a post-legislative referendum. So the Wales Act was on the statute book. It had been through this war of attrition in Parliament, uh, and then you had a referendum. Uh, 97, on the other hand, literally the first thing the Blair government did in terms of legislation was to put through a very simple, small act of Parliament saying we'll have a referendum on Scottish and Welsh devolution. Without many, well, very little in terms of detail as to what this would look like. So it's kind of quick and dirty, get through as quickly as possible, okay? Uh, that was obviously hugely advantageous to devolutionists in Wales. And of course, just to make it even more advantageous, they had the referendum in Wales a week after Scotland. <laughs> for no other reason than to boost the yes vote. There was never any proper justification for that. What, what the MPs thought they won was a rerun of 1979, okay? Not 1997. Yeah, if you're that clear, I mean, this uh, proceeds into, the, again, the internal divisions within the Labour Party, so the bulk of the Labour MPs then, and they probably still now, um, being 
cautious, maybe even hostile about extending further the powers of the assembly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this was seen as a kind of key moment. Um, again, we can go through this uh, for uh, at some length, but I'll try not to. What we get as a result of all of this is the 2006 Act. I think you call it Gawa in here, which, uh, which is to mutilate a lovely part of the world as far as I'm uh, concerned. It's, it's kind of worth pointing out, um, and we're going back to the Banana Republic without the bananas, that our first constitution lasts seven years in action. You know, this is this is South American. This is this is uh, this is not great in terms of constitutional stability. This and again, it's unfair to most of Latin America. Yes, it is unfair indeed. Uh, I apologise. I do apologise formally to Latin America. The the you know, you would hope in a political system that you want the rules to be you know you want them to be changeable. You don't want something which is cast in stone to the extent that you get kind of stasis. However. That something doesn't last longer than that is, I think, kind of uh, problematic. Um, what we get is separation of powers. What we get also, and this is kind of, I think the, the Welsh political class and certainly the opposition parties were very naive about this. What you got was all of the powers invested in the assembly, this stuff, and whatever else had accrued in the meantime was transferred to the government. Okay? So you've got a radical empowering of the government. In terms of the uh, powers of the National Assembly, well, it had powers to make legislation. We crossed the Rubicon without anybody really noticing it. Now, there was a, we got to legislative devotion. However, that was that was based on two different schemes of legislative empowerment. And uh, obviously, I'm sure you have your copy, uh, but you probably memorize it. Uh, but uh, I, I brought my copy with me. What you get is obviously two different uh, systems of legislative empowerment. One on the basis of part three of the Act, and one then on the basis of part four. Part three is based on the powers in Schedule 5. So basically, what's in Schedule 5 will allow you to make measures, measures having the same status as Acts of the UK Parliament, so potentially, potentially significant. However, when you turn to Schedule 5, what you find is 20 fields. Oh, that's, that's exciting. However, all bar one are empty. Nothing in, them, nothing in them at all, okay? So basically you had then, as you all know, a system of putting things into the field in here. Uh, and the most uh, uh, prominent element of that was the Elko, the late unlamented Elko system. I have to tell you it's great not having to explain that to the graduate students uh, anymore. But Schedule 5 was basically empty. Okay, so you had a government which was relatively powerful, a, a legislature with, with lots of empty fields. Um, people talk about exe uh, executive dominance in the world of political science. Uh, and uh, as you're working for the executive, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe you regard this as a good thing. But this is a fairly extreme form of executive dominance in terms of the disparity of powers, in particular because the assembly was then so dependent on the government to try and get stuff to put in to Schedule 5. This is a very unequal relationship. Anyway, so that system was created, it was experimental, and it worked very differently to what people had suggested that it would. I remember having a, 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 actually another heated argument with David Ellis Thomas uh, on the radio this time, and I was saying, this system is, it's got all, you know, it's not going to be, you're going to have obvious conflicts of interest between Westminster and the Assembly, and this isn't going to go well. And I remember him saying, I have better constitutional expert than Richard Wynne Jones telling me that this is going to work fine. Okay, well done. Uh, I need to remind him of that when I see him. Um, anyway, so you have that, and then you have part four. 
Part four was the unexpected bit of the, of the legislation. Remember very clearly the day that they published the white paper, uh, which became the 2006 Act. Uh, I was listening on the radio, and um, they, they, clearly all the politicians have done a kind of pre-prepared thing. Okay, so they they announced you know, the, the the government said we're announcing this great new piece of legislation, and uh, whoever was on from Plaid Cymru said this is terrible, it doesn't go far enough. Liberal Democrats, this is terrible, it doesn't go far enough. Conservatives, oh going too far. You know, <laughs> Labour, this is fantastic. So, you know, kind of listen to it and, okay, well, that's, that's it. And then, um, I was asked to go on a, a TV programme at night to kind of talk about it. And I thought, well, I, I, I'll be good. I'll, I'll read the white paper. Shock. You know, let's, let's actually know what I'm talking about when I go on the telly. And I was reading through it and suddenly I got to a description, you know, got to a description of part four. Oh, there will be a legislative parliament, proper legislative parliament after the referendum. None of this had been mentioned on the radio in the morning. None of the media stuff had covered this. And then I kind of, and I can't call my journalist friends and said, haven't you noticed that, that this is in there? And I don't know, we haven't had time to read it, obviously. <laughs> and it wasn't in the press release, it wasn't in the first executive summary in the press. Set. So, fantastic news management by somebody to keep the big thing, which would have been contentious, out from the initial headline. So what it said was basically, after a referendum, at some point in the dim and distant future, we will have, we will have a move to Schedule 7, which is act-making powers, and there is, you know, there is real substance in there. Um, that was a really interesting sleight of hand, has to be said, because that made the post-legislative referendum thing, which appeared to be so significant when the concession was granted, look a very, very different thing. Because what happened is that when, when you had the parliamentary passage of the Government of Wales Act, there was hardly any discussion of Part 4. If you go back and look at Hansard, basically people don't talk about this because it's, it's over the horizon. You know, at the time there were private uh, assurances this wouldn't happen until 2015, 2016. This was no, a long, long way away. Now, in terms of Schedule 7, the legacy of uh, devolution, executive devolution, is, is, is obvious. What they've tried to do is describe in fairly generous terms the kinds of responsibilities that you have in here. It's also the system proposed in the 1978 Scotland Act. And this is the crucial thing. When the UK government went back to legislate for Scottish devolution in the late 90s, they decided that the 78 Act was unworkable. In fact, what was interesting is they asked the people who'd been working on the Scottish legislation in the late 70s, uh, the civil servants, the people who drafted it, and they said, don't do this. This conferred powers model of devolution is going to lead to tensions between Edinburgh and London, to court cases. This is not a sensible way of de doing devolution. So they decided we do a reserve powers model instead. Okay? So the UK government made a conscious decision, uh, the Labour Party and then the UK government, not to do a conferred powers model for Scotland on the basis of advice received from the people who'd actually drawn up the legislation. But, in Wales, we went for it, okay? Without any real discussion. This, you know, because that part of the legislation just wasn't really discussed. So, we have the kind of legacy there. We have a system which a lot of people were highly doubtful about. A lot of experts were highly doubtful about. So anyway, the uh, legislation reaches the statute book. The thought is, as I say, the thought is that Part 4 is for the long-term future. But, and this is where kind of politics intervenes in interesting ways, because of the election results, and frankly because of the rather cack-handed way I think that um, 
maybe he didn't have any choice, but I don't think Claudio Moore can handle the immediate after, uh, uh, aftermath of the... Um, am I allowed to criticise uh, politicians on camera? Thank you. Um, well, I mean, I don't think that the immediate post-election uh, um, period was, was the kind of golden era in Claudio Morgan's political career, shall we say. Distinguished political career, it has to be said. Um, but anyway, what happens is that part four ends up as a key factor in coalition negotiations. And in fact, it is the kind of deal maker in terms of one side, the Plycumbery side of that coalition. So you get, therefore, the prospect of a referendum, not in 2015 or 2016 or somewhere over the horizon, but in the term of the One Wales Coalition Government. Uh, and you get the referendum, of course, held in March 2011, and you get what is uh, ultimately a very easy victory for yes, in part because the No campaign is absolutely disastrous. Uh, I think the only thing I need to say about the No campaign, if you're not already aware of this, is the total amount of money they managed to raise to run their national campaign was, give me a guess, go on, how much money did the No campaign manage to raise? Across the whole of Wales. Across the whole of Wales. Two grand. Sorry? Two grand. Oh, come on. <laughs> any, any advance? Either no, it is four and a half thousand pounds. That is the total amount that they managed to raise. Uh, so, yeah, so, very quickly, um, we get uh, the referendum, we also then subsequent, subsequently get the Silk Commission. So I think one of the kind of genuinely remarkable moments in contemporary Welsh politics tells you a lot about the kind of a slightly chaotic way the politics works and the unintended consequences of what happens in coalition negotiations. In May 2010, when the Conservatives and Lib Dems were doing their negotiating, and you remember it happened very quickly, there was a lot of time pressure on them, there was a sense that the bond markets weren't going to respond well if there wasn't a government in place. So you had the negotiation. Now, on the Conservative side, Conservatives are a kind of unitary party. It's very clear who's in charge. Uh, frankly, without wishing any disrespect to Nick Bourne or Andrew R.T. Davis, they're not key voices in the Conservative Party at the UK level. I hope that's a non-contemptuous thing to say. Lib Dems, on the other hand, are a federal party. Brings a really interesting dimension into coalition negotiations. There's some kind of formal check with the Welsh arm, um, if you like, of the party. Now, in terms of what the Welsh Lib Dems wanted out of the coalition negotiations, what they wanted was a look at Barnet, a review of the Barnet formula. They couldn't get that through. The problem wasn't the Conservatives, it was their own party. Who was actually running the coalition negotiations for the Lib Dems? It was Scots. <laughs> Who doesn't want Barnet reform? Scots, okay? So what happened was that uh, the pl what, uh, the review of Barnet was kind of ruled out of court by, essentially by Danny Alexander. Okay? And a line was dropped into the coalition agreement which said that if there's a yes vote, there will be a process similar to the Calvin Commission for Wales. Okay? This was not a form of words which had been uh, requested by the Welsh Lib Dems. In fact, I gather it was a surprise for them when they saw the final version. Now, the interesting thing about Calvin, and you know, fair play to the Welsh Lib Dems, they went to have a look. The remit for Calvin, which was something which was established in Scotland after the SNP formed the government in 2007 to review the arrangements for Scottish devolution and actually as a way of stitching up the SNP, frankly. The remit was really wide, but it was interpreted narrowly. So in terms of additional powers, I think the Scots got 
something about air guns and something about speed restrictions. I think they're the main headlines in terms of what Kalman did in terms of powers and then of course some financial stuff. But the remit was really wide. So what the, what the Welsh Lib Dems did was basically say we want the same remit for Wales. And because it was in the coalition agreement, they got it. Okay? So this was an entirely unintended consequence of the coalition negotiations. This hadn't been planned by anybody. Nobody said, okay, we're going to have this big review of devolution. But a form of words in the negotiate in the coalition agreement, coupled frankly to the Welsh Lib Dem as being slightly miffed that they hadn't got more, I think we're going to make the most of this. Then, so that, that created the opportunity, and then you had buy-in by the four Welsh parties. All of them actually then bought in to this process. There is a story, a, a rumour, which I believe is true, that they got, uh, you'll recall that Paul Davis was acting leader of the Welsh Conservatives, okay, for a period. And I'm reliably informed that I think on the last day, before Andrew R.T. Davis took over, uh, as the former leader, Paul agreed to the form of words with the other party leaders. They were very keen that this was established before Andrew uh, took over. So anyway, so the self agreement Maybe worth saying that you know, there's a clear and important difference there with Calman Commission in Scotland. Calman Commission, the SNP plays no part in, in the place. It's pretty much a, a, quite deliberately excluded from yeah. the Silk Commission, all of the parties are signing up to this. They're all playing a part, they all nominate representatives to it. So it's a genuinely cross-party inclusive process as opposed to Calman, which was by its nature only quite intentionally exclusive. Uh, and indeed, and this is this is the sole agreement. I'm, I'm just I'm showing that Roger and I are telepathically communicating with each other at the moment. The only thing which was excluded from the Calman remit uh, was a form of words, which was the keep the SNP out form of words, which is say that uh, would continue to secure the position of Scotland within the UK. There was no equivalent wording keeping Wales as part of the UK in the Silk Remit because they wanted to apply to be part of it. Okay. So one of the interesting things about the way we do things in Wales as compared to Scotland is that all four parties on the whole cooperate with each other in these kinds of contexts. Where in Scotland there's a unionist nationalist split okay, and a very deliberate attempt to exclude uh, so, you know, that form of words was put in there to keep the SNP out. It was removed to allow Plykenberg to be in, in the Welsh context. So you've got this two-part silk process. Part one, fo focusing on the emotion of fiscal powers. And then this very broad, to review the powers of the National Assembly in the light of experience and to recommend modifications to the present constitutional arrangements that would enable blah, 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 better serve the people. Wales, but not necessarily secure the position of Wales within the UK. Yeah, and, so, and if, if you look at that, what does that actually exclude? What potentially could you not talk about in Wales? Yeah, no, this is, this is huge. Have almost anything. And you've got all four, four parties buying into it. So, very briefly, just to conclude, apologies, uh, this was meant to be more interactive, but I, I'm old school teaching, ranting at the people. <laughs> it's the Fidel Castro approach to, uh, to uh, talking about Welsh politics. So, what you had, of course, was a recommendation to devolve tax powers on the basis of accountability, responsibility, parity, incentivizing growth. So, really interesting, one of the things which Scotland has brought into the debate in Wales was this idea, uh, and it's, it's been really interesting because all the unionist parties have bought into this in Scotland, saying, a government cannot be truly accountable unless it's raising some of the money that it's spending. The idea is that this creates a sense of behaviours. You're taking some of the pain for raising this money, so you're going to behave differently while you're spending it. Fiscal federalism is, is, is the phrase that's used internationally for this kind of thing. It's never been part of the Welsh debate until very recently. It's something that came in in Scotland as a result of Calman. 
And of course, it was all aimed at the SNP government. The problem the Unionist parties had is once they'd said that this was true in Scotland, then clearly it has to be true in Wales. Or do we live in a kind of parallel uh, universe somewhere? So, so th this was a new language, and of course, it's one that gives somebody like David Jones, Secretary of State, an in in interesting ways. Minor taxes, uh, the pulling things out of the ground and putting them back in again, kind of taxes transferred immediately. Income tax to be transferred after a referendum with multiple locks on having the referendum. Uh, I think criticised only by <laughs> Wynne Jones and Scully, saying this is a terrible idea, but there we are, nobody listens. No to corporation tax devolution. So that was the recommendation, and lo and behold, that is basically what we're getting. The current Wales Bill will enact pretty much all of Silk Part 1. The only substantive difference is on, uh, you know, the whole lockstep issue. Can you actually vary the bands, or do they move in lockstep? Uh, Calvin, they move in lockstep. Okay? And because Wales can't have more than Scotland, frankly, we're getting what we're getting. Interestingly, of course, uh, the lockstep, the Tories and the Lib Dems and Labour in a the Latin and quite strange way are talking about getting rid of the lockstep of Scotland. Okay. Uh, so how long will that last? Who knows? Um, the referendum is in there and there's a real issue about um, there's a real issue about the incentives of so call a referendum. Why would you do it if you're a politician? The chances of losing it are high. The amount of money that you raise is pretty low. You know, frankly, uh, my, my own guess is that uh, we'll sit on the statute book for a long, long time until anybody thinks of moving to a referendum. Uh, I know there are people in this place who think that it might be part of some kind of coalition deal in 2016, but if I was you know, if I was Leanne Wood, or Kirsty, or, yeah, or Kirsty Williams, another leap of the imagination, why would I prioritise that potentially unpopular referendum that you could lose over something else, frankly? I wouldn't bother. The other thing which is interesting is that uh, Silk basically said that we shouldn't have, um, we shouldn't have, uh, income tax devolution unless we have fair funding, okay? which is of course a reference to ban it. There was a really interesting question here, which well, maybe it's not interesting after you've been listening for a couple of hours, but what does that mean? Does it mean putting a floor in the ban it, i.e. stopping the convergence, or does it mean full blown reform, which would mean taking something like four billion out of Scotland every year, to give Wales an extra 300 million. I'm thinking the latter is unlikely, okay? And indeed, all the parties in Scotland have now said it's not going to happen, okay? So, At least but. The night, you know, September. Yeah, no, no. Well, well they've all, they, I mean, they've all, they've all, having suggested in different ways in the past, now said that binary reform is unlikely. And the Welsh Government has already kind of agreed the mechanism with Whitehall on a banner floor. And it seems to me that if I have understood what Margaret Curran, the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland, was saying in Wales a few weeks ago, I think that Labour is going to end up with some kind of ban for mechanism in it. So we may have fair funding, according to, according to our political masters, fairly soon. And then, finally, finally, uh, so part two. Obviously much more contentious. This is much, much more contentious. Um, the fact that the parties, the unionist parties, had signed up to Calman meant it was very difficult to avoid kind of agreeing with part one. So, you know, it, 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 there was a, uh, the logic was kind of compelling and very difficult to oppose. So part two was much, much more contentious. What we've got, of course, is suggested uh, that we should move to a reserve powers model. So Scotland 98, not Scotland 78. That was favoured by the Richard Commission back in 2004, supported strongly by Carwin Jones 
and the Welsh Government. That would be a really big moment because it breaks the path dependency. All the legacy of executive devolution gets cast aside. As you know, with the reserve powers model, the assumption is it's devolved unless there's a reason not to. It's a very different mentality from the Bees Act and the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 or whatever, and the legacy of that which is still there. Indeed, I noticed, and of course I'm sure that you, like me, read UKIP policy pronouncements regularly, they've come out in favour of reserve powers model too. I think that we now have one politician, admittedly quite an influential politician, uh, who is against uh, reserve powers model. He's the only person I've ever heard made a kind of reasoned argument in favour of reserve powers. Okay? So, there's that. We've also got the suggestion that you gradually devolve criminal justice as a whole over a decade or so. Again, supported by the Welsh Government, opposed, however, by the Conservatives uh, and by, uh, I am given to understand, uh, at least some Welsh Labour MPs. This is, again, if there was time and there isn't, there's a whole kind of argument about how legal jurisdiction and uh, legislative devolution work together. The other thing which um, Silk, again, ignoring its own, or shall we say, stretching the elastic of its remit, it suggested the assembly should be bigger. And interestingly, in a form of, an incredibly convoluted form of words, the Welsh Government last week seemed to suggest that it was in favour of that. Two, uh, by reducing the number of councillors is the, is the uh, implication. That's how you do it without costing any money. Yeah. Well, and also, and also, of course, that's how you do it without upsetting MPs. So that which is Wales is overrepresented uh, by quite some margin in Westminster. We should have 32 members if we're on the same basis uh, as England at the moment. Um, um, 40. Interestingly, of course, you've got inter-party tensions within both of the main parties on that. Sorry, I keep bumping into this. And so it's going to be really interesting to see what's in the 2015 manifesto. Uh, Ed Miliband has already said that we will have a reserve powers model. Uh, whether any of this stuff, whether the evolution of policing, for example, makes it into Labour's manifesto, is a really interesting question. But it's highly likely that we'll have a 2018 Wales Act, Government of Wales Act. So we'll, we'll have our fifth, maybe, depending how you count constitutional dispensation uh, since 1999. Uh, with it. <laughs> you know, it, it is, it is uh, quite remarkable, but in, you know, in a 20-year period, we'll probably have had four or five different constitutional settlements for Wales. But certainly, if we do get to reserve powers model, I think that is, that is, you know, that is the point where talking about 1969 and all this stuff becomes redundant. And, and can Roger can wheel me off into some kind of sanatorium somewhere to talk to people about Labour's internal politics in the 1960s. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Roger. Uh, yeah. Well, do you, you, you just have to listen to the page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and before we finish, are, are there any questions, um, comments, um, things that are insufficiently clear or whatever that you, that you would like to clarify? Uh, yes, please. It is a fact, of course, that we are now on our third referral since 2011 of Welsh legislation, and there's never been a similar referral of either Scottish or indeed Northern Irish legislation. And the the people who, the kind of Scottish specialists who critique the 1978 model in Scotland, and the people who've been influential in getting the UK government to go for reserve rather than conferred in the late 90s, were very clear in saying there's an ambiguity. There's, the, the, the conferred model is more ambiguous to start with. And also that the balance of power works against the devolved level. Okay? So it's always the devolved level having to prove that it should be allowed to do something rather than vice versa, rather than the assumption being it should. So my own view, for what it's worth, is that yes, you could you know you could probably 
redraft your Schedule 7 in ways which are less ambiguous. There are probably things that you could do, but I think that this is about um, more than that. It's, it's actually about changing mindsets. So, uh, and it's about removing some of the ambiguity, and of course there is always tension within any multi-level system. There's also ch shifting the burden of proof in things, in ways which I think would be advantageous to the devolved level, which is so much weaker, obviously, than the central level. So yeah, I'm, you know, I, pretty much since the day after the 2011 referendum, I've been on, a, on my high horse suggesting that the conferred powers model was problematic and you know, every Supreme Court uh, referral makes me more confident in, in that view. A great deal will depend, I suspect, on what happens on the 18th of September in Scotland. If, as is still the more likely outcome, Scotland votes no, but not by an overwhelming margin, then we're into, I think, con continued constitutional uncertainty and, and debate, but you know, independence for Scotland is, is off the agenda for at least some significant period. Um, and all of the polls, no matter how you ask the question, show that at the moment there's very limited support for independence in Wales. It varies from about 5% to about 14%, depending on what question form and wording you choose. If Scotland were to vote yes, then I think it might change the nature of the debate in which we have in Wales. Doesn't necessarily mean that we would become independent, but it might start to make it appear a more realistic part of the political agenda, particularly you know, if Scotland votes yes, and then a few years down the line it seems to be manifestly making a success of independence. Then I think it potentially at least becomes a serious part of the political agenda. But unless or until that happens, but, I mean, frankly, I think um, you know, public support in Wales has long been much more limited for independence, and the main party that would be interested in pushing it is also weaker than, than the equivalent of the SNP in Scotland. So I think mean, quite a lot of sort of planets have to come into alignment <laughs> before you get the position where I think there is a referendum on independence. Uh, in Wales, with any sort of remotely realistic chance of actually voting yes. My kind of uh, response to that is the studying evolution over the kind of years has made me very uncomfortable in predicting anything. Because, you know, if you think about 1970, if you think of the 2nd of March 1979, when evolution had been overwhelmingly rejected 4 to 1 every part of Wales, every social group, you know, annihilated. And it did appear that was it to many people at the time. Uh, the idea that we're now in a position where, you know, confidently talking about, you know, there will be more evolution, and we'll, we will be on our fifth constitution soon. Um, you know, things change rapidly in unexpected ways and for unexpected reasons, um, you know, uh, and who knows, the, if we have, for example, a radical right-wing government, another radical right-wing government in London, which is really intent on, on a small state kind of approach, which gets out of the European Union, you know, there are all kinds of possibilities which will have all kinds of unintended consequences. So, yeah, Roger is absolutely right in terms of his analysis, but you know, if you're looking 20 years ahead, you know, you're a very brave person to make any predictions, I think. I think it was an observable phenomenon that from about the beginning of this century through to about 2010, your Labour support did slip further and faster in Wales than it did in, in either Scotland or England. And it did seem that, you know, this long, about 80, 90 years long Labour dominance in Welsh politics was maybe coming to an end. Then you sort of more or less from the moment the ink was dry on the London coalition agreements, Labour's poll ratings in Wales shot back up <laughs> and spent about two and a half years being right back at the sort of levels Labour was enjoying in its strongest periods in the late 1990s or even in the early 1960s. I mean, 
But then, in the last 18, 15 to 18 months or so, there's been a um, really interesting and only starting to now be noticed phenomenon where Labour in Wales is falling in support quite substantially and, and relatively rapidly. The fall in Labour support in Britain wide polls over the last 12 months is nowhere near as large as the fall in Labour support in Wales. Um, and so we seem to be heading back to that sort of situation we were seeing in, say, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, where, you know, having briefly resurged as the ultimate Labour capacity in Wales actually seems to be going back now to um, the position we were in just a few years ago where this historic dominance is starting to look somewhat more vulnerable. Having said that, though, the electoral arrangements we have in place are still pretty favourable to the Labour Party. If you look at the next general election, there are not many Labour held seats that are coming in vulnerable. If you look at the assembly election as well, um, the sort of semi-proportional nature of the voting system um, and related to that Labour's dominance, the South Wales constituency element of that means that it's extremely difficult to see a, a vaguely plausible scenario in which Labour could be replaced as the largest party in the Assembly. I mean, you can well see Labour falling to maybe 24, 25 seats if they're having a bad year, but falling below that and some other party coming to challenge them is actually really difficult. And I've sort of gained various mathematical scenarios, say if Ply Cummy, for instance, was having a really good year and ended up with about 4 or 5% more in share, share of the vote than Labour, and Labour's still coming out with more seats. Um, so I think, you know, compared to what we're thinking about in relation to the polls a couple of years ago, I think you know, Labour is looking much weaker than it was a year ago. But it can still actually win quite a lot of representatives in Wales on a level of support that by historic Labour standards in Wales is, is, is very poor. Yeah. The other thing to add to that, of course, is that Labour is very fortunate in its opposition. Because yeah, I mean, in Scotland they've had basically one single clear alternative party. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I mean, in 2007, say when the assembly elections, Labour got basically the identical vote share in Scotland and Wales. But in Scotland you have a single clear alternative party. In Wales there wasn't that, and so you know, one or two seats the Conservatives picked up support, one or two Ply picked up support. You've got you know the Independents and Blaney went. But there was no clear single alternative. Um, and it's very difficult to foresee how any of you know the Conservatives have had a problem in Wales since well, basically democracy was bad news. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just in terms of they've always underperformed uh, England, like Cymru, for reasons which relate to the nature of our society. Their support is, you know, it, it, it's it's pretty solid, but it's it's confined to particular areas. And they've struggled to translate. So, for example, the Conservatives, you know, there's been this big effort to try and change the uh, image of the Conservative Party moves, but that's a generational project, and you only need somebody like David Jones coming along. Will it do that very quickly? Because you know? he doesn't believe in that, in, in the kind of Nick Bourne project. He doesn't share that view of where that, that party should be going. So, I think as long as there's no coherent challenger. I mean, if you think of all the other kind of one-party systems which have eventually fallen apart, um, you know, most unionists, eventually the UP came along and, and out unionized them or whatever they've done, you know, so you need somebody to come along as a challenger to actually finally break that down. But what you have, I think, is a lot of softness. So I think, you know, the UK, I've just, just finished writing an article about UKIP and how that might play through in the next... Uh, few elections in Wales, which is 